It's a little tight up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a rundown of what's going on. Um, we're doing the Augustan period in Rome. And uh, so, you, oh, <coughs> <laughs> so to give some context, um, this age was really influential on literary works and art in general, and it marked the age of peace and prosperity. Um, out, of, out of this came literary works, which were usually poems, and they had themes of like love, nature, and patriotism. And uh, many important writers came about, like Virgil, Horace, and Ovid. And today we're going to be talking about Ovid's Metamorphosis. And, uh, you know, it's funny because it was uh, back in the day, they were like, he's never going to die kind of thing. And uh, his work's still discussed today, which is really neat. And um, Metamorphosis is a, is a poem that's composed of 15 different books in, within the poem. And uh, they all are connected by different kinds of uh, transformations that happen throughout each of the little books, which is why it's called Metamorphosis. But um, they all get connected together, and these stories have a certain point and theme that go with the change of the Augustan period that was going on at the time. And um, the values that they held in this time had not been so focused on uh, like peace and prosperity at the time because it was really hectic. There was a war before um, the Emperor Augustus got the, the Augustus did. Um, anyways, so he wanted to be different than other writers like uh, Homer. He wrote about um, rather than having a battle for a woman that was like swords clashing and just all out fighting, uh, Ovid would make it sort of kind of comedic so he wouldn't be confused or like mimic anybody else from, the, from that time. And um, my group members are going to explain like each of the values that are in each of the books um, from this time. I'll say. Okay, so from right from the beginning of book one, we get a very good idea of what sort of values that they had during the Augustan period. Be one of the first stories in this first book is the creation story. And in this story, everything is all <coughs> off the wall, crazy, super chaotic, and there is, and, the, and it seems like there is no salvaging like anything. Then an unspecified god comes in, and he says, and he's like, wow, this sucks. I'm going to create. I'm going to create stuff and create this world and bring some structure. So that's exactly what he does. He creates humans. He creates animals. He creates all the stuff that we see now. I mean, it looked kind of different back then, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and so that gives a. And so with this story, we get an, an inkling that these people valued structure. We they valued things being in order and set a certain way, as opposed to things being out of control and being crazy. <laughs> and this is <clears throat> it's also kind of interesting to note that this is kind of, that this is a god and not a god s which which I mean it's not super super important but it does at least give us a little hint of some more values that I'm about to discuss soon. And and let's see. Okay. And so and going off of the whole order thing, a very specific brand of of order that we have, and that is that it's very a very patriarchal society. Basically, that's what I'm getting at here. Men have a lot had a lot of power over women here, and we see that in a few of the stories later on in Book One, like Apollo and Apollo and Daphne, for instance. Apollo, Apollo looks at. Daphne and he's like, wow, she's hot after getting struck with Cupid's arrow and all that fun stuff, but yeah, but still. And so and he literally chases her all throughout the forest, trying to get her, and she is so desperate to get away from him because he won't take no for an answer. She tur so she turns herself into a tree. And she still can't get away from him from him. 
he's still like, oh, ha, like, ooh, hi, my beautiful, sexy tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's no escaping this. There's no escaping this whatsoever. Which has some very, which has some, which is very telling, very telling. And we get a, <coughs> and we get another inkling of that in a later story in book one, Job and Io, where Io doesn't want Job, and so he turns her into a cow, a freaking cow, and has sex with the cow, and has a child with the cow. She does eventually get away from that, but but that's after having sex with him as a cow and giving birth. But still, basically. Basically, this tells us that women didn't really have much of a say as to who could have them and who couldn't. They could try and resist and get away and try to get away from them as much as from this dude as much as they wanted. But in the end, it was hopeless. They just had to resign themselves to their fate. And if they, and if a dude wanted them, they, he pretty much had her, which kind of sucks. I was actually reading a thesis discussing this, and. And this thesis I said, and this thesis I was reading, um, the, the author of it was Dealey Jordan, by the way. What could she say? The problem of female silence in Ovid's *Metamorphosis*. That's the name. That, that's, the, that's the name of it. And she kind of talks up, and she kind of talks about how even though this was a pretty oppressive time for women, Ovid still kind of gave them a voice in some way, shape, or form by by shedding light on their feelings, which was. Kind of ahead of his time, honestly. Honestly, she also discusses him being silenced as a poet, and so maybe, and so maybe he felt some sympathy towards women. But that's another discussion for another day. So, yeah, gender. Hi, Addy. Hello. So, bouncing off what Seth said, um, in book nine, it's about this couple, and the husband's name is Lygdus, and the wife's name is Telethusa. Well, they get pregnant, or she gets pregnant. And before she has the baby, like she's like really well alone, so obviously she can't get an abortion or anything at this time. And the guy tells her, her husband tells her, that um, if it's not a boy, we're just gonna kill it when it's born. And she was like, um, okay, no. And the women in this time, as Seth was saying, like they didn't really have much of a voice, so she couldn't really be like, um, no, you're not just gonna kill my child. So she had to go with it. And um, so one night before she gave birth, the goddess Io, Io came to her, but her name is also Isis, and which is whatever. And um, so she told her that everything was going to be okay. Well, long story short, the baby was born, and it was a girl. And as this girl grew older, they just told the dad that it was a boy. I don't really know how the dad didn't get that, but whatever. So when she turns 13, the dad still thinks she's a boy and arranges her to get married with another girl in her class who she actually is deeply in love with. And so this kind of goes on the whole marriage value in the Augustan times because women didn't really have a say so, they were just kind of assigned to whoever they were married. And they couldn't really, they weren't really married to love, they were married to like have children and have heirs and carry the name on. And so when she, they were about to get married, but the mom kept putting the day off, kept putting the day off because the other girl was gonna know. And so she prayed to the god I goddess Isis, and Isis transformed her into a boy, and so they did get to get married. So on that, like, the transformation throughout Metamorphosis is just seen in, like, every single book, just, like, in different ways. So, yeah. Okay, my voice lowers. But throughout the entire books, they had different tragedies that led to transformation. And so, basically, in that time, like they would use, if you did something wrong or even a death or anything, like it would change someone into something else. So a few examples were, and Phoenix's death, it turned his sisters and into trees because they were so sad over their death. So it wasn't really, a, it was his tragedy, but they turned them into trees because of that. And also Callisto changed into a bear because he was cursed because of his betrayal. <coughs> I'm sorry. And the raven turned black because of, he told Apollo about his favorite girl that was basically cheating on him with someone else. And Apollo got upset because he told, told him that and Apollo ended up killing his favorite girl, which he found out she was pregnant later on, which caused him to curse the raven and turn it black. Um, Charon's daughter turned into horses 
and the face turned him into that because she was giving prophecies to people about their sons and everything. And so that the face didn't want her to give any more prophecies, so instead he just turned them into, turned her into a horse. And basically, that's what it is. Because it's a lot of different transformations all throughout the books because that's how they ended up dealing with their tragedies. Instead of doing something else, the gods would just change them into something else so that they wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so before we continue on with this, I just want to note um, that we are, um, I'm going to be posting the sample questions for the midterm exam tonight, right? So those will show up in Georgia View in the syllabus and assignments. Um, if for whatever reason I don't post them tonight, uh, because I'm always promising to do things and then forgetting, um, then please do uh, just somebody let me know. All right, so um, <clears throat> before I get too deeply into this, uh, I just want to um, gauge your reactions uh, to this text. How did this go for you? What'd you think? It's a little messed up. Okay, what what do you mean by a little messed up? What's messed up about it? That, like, they're fighting their family members. Are you talking about the metamorphoses? Sorry, I thought you were talking about this one. My bad. That was last week. My bad. Right. Okay, metamorphoses. Any, any thoughts, any comments? Yeah, Jared. Like, I know it's supposed to like, be together and like, you know, kind of intertwined, but at the same time, it's really confusing because there's a lot of P names, I feel. Yeah. Like, 20 P names, and I just couldn't figure <laughs> out if this one was related to this one, who's related to who. Yeah, and it, it, it's, um, it's a little joke. Yeah, it goes from story to story to story, right? How many of you ever watched, like, uh, there are some sketch comedy shows that work according to a similar kind of take, like Old Money Python shows work according to this technique, right? You have one sketch that bleeds into another sketch that bleeds into another sketch, right? And there's no direct connection, right? But one character or idea from one sketch will wander into the next one. That's kind of the way this is structured, right? It's like if we look at the Apollo and Daphne um, story, for example. The father of Daphne is a minor figure in the beginning of the Jovanio story, right? And the Pan and Syrinx story is woven into the Jovanio story. And when we get to the end of the Jovanio story, right, we have a, a kind of role reversal story where instead of turning someone else into a cow, <coughs> Jupiter turns himself into a bull, right? So there's always some little seed of the next story in the one that we're reading. But we get the seeds really for the whole narrative, and I think the kind of the connecting logic of the whole narrative in that first part that Seth was talking about, right? If we look on page 1077, the creation, right? Can I get a volunteer to read a little bit of this? Starting with before the before the seas and lands have been created. <coughs> yeah, to start there. Yep. Before the seas and lands have been created, before the skies that covers everything, nature displayed a single aspect only throughout the cosmos. Chaos was its name, a shapeless, unwrought mass of inert bulk, and nothing more, with the dis discord discordant seeds of disconnected elements all heaped together in an in anarchic di disarray. The sun, as yet, did not light up the earth, nor did the crescent moon renew her horns, nor was the earth suspended in midair, balanced by her own weight, nor did the ocean extend her arms to the margins of the land. Although the land and sea and air were present, land was unstable, the sea unfit for swimming, and air lacked light, 
Shapes shifted constantly, and all things were at odds with one another. For in a single mass cold strove with warm yet wet as opposed to dry and soft to hard. And weightlessness to matter, ha to matter having weight. Okay, thank you, Seth. You can stop there. So what's the first principle of creation here? What's the thing that exists before anything else did? Chaos. Chaos. So what does this mean everything in the universe is made out of? Everything else. It's all together. Everything is just crazy and jumbled. <coughs> yeah. Chaos for Ovid here, right, is the basic building block of creation, right? The only constant in the universe, the thing that's always been there, is change, is anarchy, right? That's what everything is made out of. So when some god or kind or nature, right, and why does he just say some god or kind or nature? Why doesn't he name a specific god? Doesn't matter, right? <laughs> doesn't help, it doesn't matter. Some god or kind of nature puts everything in order, right? Settle this dispute by separating earth from heaven, then by separating sea from earth, and fluid ether from the denser air, and after these were separated out and liberated from the primal heap, he bound the disentangled elements, each in its place, and all in harmony, right? But that harmony is artificial. That harmony required some being to step in and put everything in order. And as such, it could come apart again at any minute. Now, does this story, uh, just before I proceed here with the, on this, along this uh, train of thought, does this story look in any way familiar? Does it look like other things we've read? Yeah, we... We find similar elements here, right, from the beginning of the uh, Enuma Elish, right? Hesiod's Theogony, and the first two chapters of Genesis, right? Now, in the Enuma Elish in Genesis, right, the pre-existing element before everything else is created is water, right? There's water before there's anything else. In theogony, there is this kind of, there is a thing called chaos, right? But chaos just means nothingness, right? A kind of yawning gap. But here, yeah, the first principle of creation is anarchy, is change, is chaos. Does anybody remember, by the way, what this kind of myth is called? Yes, it's a cosmogony, yes. Alright, cosmos, universe. Goni, birth, right, from the Greek. So yeah, birth of the cosmos, birth of the universe. Now, why does this matter? What, what's particularly important about this? Well, if we look at the particular values of the Augustan age, some of which our group told us about, let's try to go into a little bit more detail, uh, detail here, though. Um, Ovid is writing a generation after a civil war in Rome that ended the old Roman Republic <coughs> and began a line of imperial succession, right? Augustus was the first emperor of Rome. And it was during the latter part of Augustus' life that Ovid wrote. So how many of you are familiar with, uh, even with the Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar? Any of you have, did any of you have to read Julius Caesar in high school? Right? Friends, Roman countrymen, lend me your ears, right? I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him, all that shit. Okay, so Caesar had been part of a ruling triumvirate in the late Roman Republic. He betrayed the other two members of that triumvirate, went to war against the stronger of the two, a guy by the name of uh, Gaius Pompey defeated Pompey, came back and triumphed to Rome, declared himself dictator or sole ruler. Got assassinated by a group of Roman senators who wanted to preserve the Republic and felt Caesar was a threat to it. 
Caesar's supporters go to war against the supporters of the Republic. Caesar's supporters win. Caesar's reporters, supporters then fall on each other and tear each other apart. And the winner is Caesar's nephew, Octavian, who adopts the name Augustus and becomes emperor of Rome, right? Essentially fulfills <coughs> his uncle's ambitions. So Augustus as emperor, and he, re he reigned for a rather long time, um, Augustus promoted the idea of stability and structure as important Roman values. Right, this was what he wanted. And as such, he patronized artists who were willing to promote his particular idea of what Roman life should be like. Um, for example, uh, Bradley mentioned the Roman poet Virgil. Right, Virgil is a poet who's about a, maybe a generation older than Ovid. And Virgil is best known for an epic called the Aeneid. Any of you familiar with the Aeneid? Any of you ever heard of the Aeneid? Any of you know anything about the Aeneid? Yes. Yes, Sarah. Uh, I mean, isn't it basically a story about the founding of Rome and we're like <laughs> connecting Octavian to some then you got, it's, it's mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, <coughs> the basic plot of the, the Aeneid, right, is that a Trojan prince by the name of Aeneas escapes the destruction of Troy by the Greeks, follows his destiny to the Italian peninsula, where he and his men first go to war against and then end up sort of intermingling with a native Italian tribe. And they form, they, they then found what will become Rome a few generations later. And so it provides the bloodline that will eventually lead to Augustus. Right? The basic point of this, right, is that Rome is simply the continuation of an older civilization, right? Rome is the continuation of Troy. So, in a sense, Rome has always been, right? Not always in the same place, but it is eternal, right? This idea, you will often see this expressed as eternal Rome. Now, in the Roman Republic, what eternal Rome meant was that Rome would never fall as long as the citizens of Rome worked hard to maintain it. Under Augustus, Eternal Rome refers instead to the idea of Rome as a continuous society that cannot fall, right? So the central image of the Aeneid, and really one of the central artistic images of Augustus's reign, is the image of Aeneas. Um, I apologize, as usual, for the general shittiness of my artwork. Um, Aeneas leading by the hand his young son Ascanius and carrying on his shoulders his elderly father Anchises. Let's give this guy a long beard so we see he's old. Right? It's the current generation carrying the past generation, right? Carrying the previous generation, caring for them in their old age. And leading along the next, guiding and teaching, right? So your responsibilities are not to yourself. Your responsibilities are to your parents, to your children, and to Rome, right? There's um, a concept that is usually uh, rendered in Latin as pietas, or it, this doesn't really translate cleanly into English, but it means something like duty. Right, the Roman citizen under Augustus is defined by his sense of duty to his family and to the state, right? 
what you want and what you need doesn't matter. What matters is what your family needs and what Rome needs. Right? The individual family is a sort of microcosm for Rome, kind of like the Greek oikos, right, was a, was a microcosm for, the, for the, the Greek state, right, the Greek city-state. Right? A bunch of individual families make up the whole city. So <clears throat> this is the kind of society that Augustus envisions, right, a society that's structured, hierarchical, and obedient. So, why might it be problematic for Augustus or someone who shares Augustus's values that Ovid portrays the entire world as being made out of chaos and anarchy? What might Ovid then be saying about this whole happy little structure that Augustus has built up? Where it might end a new... Um something might begin. Okay, I knew something might hit. It, yeah. It, is, is, this, is this a might? Well, it will. Begin. Exactly, yeah. This is going to fall like everything else does, right? Everything falls apart because order is an illusion that has to be maintained artificially, right? Order has to be maintained by someone or something strong enough to maintain it. And once that's gone, things revert back to chaos, right? And yeah, go ahead, Kathy. So this actually kind of reminds me of like modern day, you know? Okay. Like, when I saw that, it's like, I have to like carry my um, my parents, my grandparents. Oh, sure. And, right? and then I have to leave my younger siblings and mm -hmm. everything. So what I've been noticing is that Americans these days is that they only care for themselves. And now that I see it, there's more chaos than ever before from what I've seen. Yeah, and I, I think this, this is not the idea of um, your relationships to others and relationships to the state being the defining element of your personality is not unique to Rome. But it is something that's a new development in Rome in this particular period. Um, and yeah, we're not talking about a culture that particularly values individualism or individual achievement here. Yeah, 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 that, that's, yeah that, that's absolutely, that is absolutely relevant, yeah. Um, we are talking about a culture that has just been through a couple decades of horrific war and is trying to put itself back together after that. So that's what I can say in defense of Augustus, right, in defense of Augustus's program. Um, Ovid, being a poet um, of comical sensibility, kind of likes to poke fun at this sort of idea and try to point out how utterly ridiculous and how completely artificial this setup is. And so we see throughout this um, kind of mocking references to conventions of epic, right? So let's just go back for a second to what an epic usually looks like. If we think back to um, previous conversations we've had about epic, what does an epic usually, usually feature? Okay, yeah, there's usually a, a, a clear linear plot, right? There's a definite narrative in an epic. A hero. A hero. A journey. Sometimes there is, pardon? A journey. Sometimes a journey, although not always, right? The Iliad all takes place, for example, in the same place. And the basic idea, right? Odysseus, for is Odysseus is trying to get home in order to reestablish himself as king, right? And restore order to his kingdom. The Greeks come to Troy in order to establish their supremacy over a rival civilization and take back something they think has been stolen from them, right? Gilgamesh, at the end of his journey, learns to stop being such a shitty king. And Aeneas, at the end of his journey, is going to found a dynasty that's going to build a new, a new empire, right? So most early epic is in some way about civilization building. <laughs> right? 
right? You're laying the foundations for a new civilized order in Epic. Now, Ovid is referencing Epic in the length of his poem, in the fact that he invokes a muse at the beginning of the poem, and in that he uses the meter that Greek and Latin poets always wrote epic in. They always wrote epic in a meter called hexameter. It's essentially it's 18 syllable lines. But the content of Ovid's poem kind of in a lot of ways mocks the nature of epic. If we look, for example, on page 1079, the beginning of the Apollo and Daphne um, <coughs> episode. Can I get a volunteer to read, uh, starting with Daphne, the daughter of the river god? Anybody? Daphne, the daughter of Thank the you. river god, Peneus, was the first little Apollo. This happened not by chance, but by the cool outrage of Cupid. Phoebus, in the triumph of his great victory against the Python, observed him bending back his bow and said, What are you doing with such human arms? That, that should be void. That bow befits our wrong, wherewith we deal out wounds to savage beasts and other mortal foes, unerringly. Just now, with our innumerable arrows, we managed to lay low the mighty Python, whose as the ritual belly color of it. Contain yourself with trembling in the earth's hair, as the resource of the plan of war. The sun of Venus is a temple of this. The arrow of Phoebus may strike everything. Mine will strike you as animals survive. Your glory is so much less than mine. He spoke and soaring over it through the air, only with that thunder, in no time at all, and landed on harnesses. Shaded height and comes covered through two arrows out which operate at cross purposes. The one engendered flight ever below, the latter has a polished tip of gold, former has a tip of gold blunt lead. With this one, Cupid struck Penny's daughter while Elder appears to follow to an arrow. Okay, you can stop now. Thank you, Alicia. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what has Apollo just come back from doing when he is when he has starts this argument with Cupid? Uh, killing Python? Yeah, killing the Python, right? So he's just had this battle against a serpent monster, right? And this is an archetypal epic moment, right? The hero or the, de the god or the demigod killing the monster, which prevents the building of a civilization, right? And he comes back and he boasts about it. And what's Cupid's response? <laughs> How does Cupid respond to Apollo's taunt? Yeah, what what is what is Cupid's power? What does he do? What is he the god of? Love. love. Affection. Yeah, well, love and affection are nice ways of putting it. <laughs> right? Emotion. Emotion is also a nice way of putting it. Essentially like, like Cupid is not the little bear the, in Roman mythology is not the little bare bottomed cherub um, that appears on greeting cards, right? Um, Cupid is a naked, winged teenage boy um, who uses his arrows to kindle erotic feeling in people, right? So basically, Cupid's are, if he fires you, if he fires the gold arrow at you, it makes you horny. If he fires the lead arrow at you, it makes you frigid, right? And makes you want to flee from whoever is trying to pursue you. So. What Cupid does here, right, this is a sort of, um, it's a mockery of the kind of divine wrath trope that we see in epics, right? So we've seen in Gilgamesh, right? Gilgamesh and Enkidu piss Ishtar off. And so she sends a bull to ravage the city of Uruk. Odysseus pisses Poseidon off. 
And so Poseidon wrecks his ship and causes him to wander the Mediterranean for the better part of a decade, right? Apollo pisses Cupid off, and Cupid makes him burn with lust for a girl who wants nothing to do with him, right? So on the one hand, this reduces the scale of epic down to being to personal relationships, right? So from civilizational conflicts to personal relationships. The other thing it demonstrates too is like, what is the more powerful force here? Right? Apollo is the god of light and music and philosophy and medicine, right? So he's a god of civilized arts. What's more powerful than civilization? Lust. Yeah. Lust wins out, right? Cupid is the mightier. Cupid is more powerful, right? The idea here being that people will follow their loins more often than they follow their heads. And that even the god of philosophy himself can be driven to behave in ways he wouldn't normally by lust. I think you guys actually covered pretty well some of the, the ickier um, implications of this particular myth, right? That you know, even though Daphne is turned into a tree, gets away, in a sense, gets away from Apollo, in another sense, she can't get away because she's rendered immobile, right? So she has to submit to his caresses, right? And then what does he do with this tree? Heaven knows oh, no. what <laughs> he does that tree after the story ends. No, no, <laughs> what is, let's, let, me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. <laughs> what does he take from the tree? Although you cannot be my bride, page 1082, he says, you will assuredly be my own tree, O Laurel, and will always find yourself girding my locks, my lyre, and my quiver too. You will adorn great Roman generals whose every voice, when every voice cries out in joyful triumph along the route up to the capital. You will protect the portals of Augustus, guarding on either side his crown of oak. As I am, perpetually youthful, my flowing locks unknown to the barber's shears, so you will be an evergreen forever, bearing your brilliant foliage with glory. So he takes her leaves to make a crown that's to be given to victorious generals, to superior poets, right? To the victors of athletic competitions, right? So he takes this laurel tree, which to him represents feminine resistance, right? And makes it into a symbol of masculine victory. Do we see anything similar in the Pan and Searing uh, story? If we look on page 1087, right? The whole plot of this particular story is similar, right? Pan desires the nymph Syrinx. Syrinx wants nothing to do with Pan. Pan chases her. She turns into a plant. And he makes something out of the plant, right? The god, much taken by the sweet new voice of an unprecedented instrument, said this to her. At least we may converse with one another. I can have that much. That pipe of reeds, unequal in their lengths, and joined together one on one with wax, took the girl's name and bears it to this day. So he makes um, a kind of like, uh, I remember seeing as a kid, early in the morning before school, these commercials um, for albums by Zamfir, Master of the Pan Flute. You know, it's you know, this, this, you know, it's a couple of reeds bound together and they're each a different length and you sort of run it under your lips and blow, right? That's the instrument that he's talking about here, right? So in both cases here, right, the laurel crown and the making of the syrinx, 
Right? We have a relationship between male sexual frustration and art. Right? The male god is denied what he wants and ends up making some kind of art object or object related to art out of it, right? Now what's the difference in the Joven Io story? How is that different from the Apollo and Daphne or the Pan Searing story? Well, he's the one who turns her into something instead of her turning herself into something. Yeah, he turns her into something, and Jove gets what he wants, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it is actually significant that he turns her into a heifer, right? What is a heifer? Cow. It's a cow. Is it just a cow? A female cow. A female cow, a cow, a female cow. Yeah. It's a female cow who is not yet calved, right? So, a heifer is actually symbolically important in that. This was the most popular sacrificial animal. In the Roman religion. If you were sacrificing an animal to the gods, odds are it was going to be a heifer. Usually it had to be like a, you know, a perfect unblemished heifer, right? The gods didn't accept. Uh, sacrifices that were flawed in some way. So, <clears throat> the symbolism here, right, is that Jove essentially makes his mistress a sacrifice to his wife, to Juno, right? In order to continue to pursue his own pleasure. So, what we get in these first couple of stories is lustful gods bullying mortals, right? Basically forcing themselves um, onto mortals. And are there ever any real consequences for the gods? Apart from maybe a little bit of heartache, right? This is another theme of epic. Right? If you look at the Odyssey, if you look at the Iliad, right, every time the gods get into a dispute, it ends in feasting on Mount Olympus, right? Nothing bad ever really happens to the gods for very long. They just go back to partying. There are no real consequences for their actions, right? All of the consequences are borne by mortals. Right? Daphne is desired by Apollo, doesn't want him, refuses him, so she has to be turned into a tree. Io is pursued across the world by Juno, so she has to sort of you know live as a cow for a while and then sort of give birth in pain on the banks of the Nile, right? To Jupiter's child. All of the consequences in a lot of these early stories are for mortals, and the gods can largely sort of get off scot-free. So <clears throat> while this is normal and epic. Ovid's treatment of it is a little bit more comic than usual, a little bit more irreverent than usual, and so he was often accused by his contemporaries of being impious, right, of making fun of the gods. And yeah, he probably was. But if we, we can see sort of more examples of the gods messing with humans and not caring much about the consequences, if we look at the whole sort of, at the whole Pygmalion through Adonis narrative, right? this is a continuous narrative, it's the story of one family, right? What has Pygmalion done? What's this guy like? If we look on page 1104, can I get a volunteer to start reading from Pygmalion Observed?
Now you observe Thank how, you, sir. how these women live lives of sordid indecency and dismayed by the numerous defects of character and nature have given the feminine spirit, stayed as a bachelor, having no female companion. During that time, he created an ivory statue, a work of most marvelous art, and gave it a figure better than any living woman could boast of, and promptly conceived a passion for his own creation. He would have thought of a wife, so like a real maiden, that only its natural modesty kept it from moving. Art concealed artfulness. Pygmalion gazed in amazement, burning with love for what was in likeness of body. Often he stretched forth a hand to touch his creation, attempting to settle the issue. Was it a body, or was it, this he would not yet concede, a mere statue? He gets kisses, and they are returned. He imagines, now he addresses, and now he caresses it, feeling his fingers sink into its warm, pliant flesh, and fears he will leave blue bruises all over its body. He seeks to win its affections with words and with presents pleasing to girls, such as seashells and pebbles, tame birds, armloads of flowers in thousands of different colors, lilies, bright painted balls, curious insects in amber. He dresses it up and puts diamond rings on its fingers, gives it a necklace, a lacy brassiere, and pearl earrings. And even though all such adornments truly become her, she does not seem to be any less beautiful naked. He lays her down on a bed with a bright purple cover and calls her his bedmate and slips a few soft downy pillows under her head as though she were able to feel them. Okay, thank you. So, what has this guy done? What has Pygmalion done? He made a sex doll. <laughs> Essentially, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's really not that far off an interpretation of this. He has made for himself a female companion that essentially has to put up with whatever he wants to do to it, right? And I say it because it is a statue here, right? It's, an, it's, a literal, it's literally an object, right? She can't talk back to him. She can't argue with him. She has no will of her own. He can behave as he likes towards her, right? He has essentially created for himself his own ideal silent woman, right? And yet, is this actually enough for him? He wants her to be a real flesh and blood woman, right? So he prays to Venus. We see here, right? The holiday honoring Venus has come, and all Cyprus turns out to celebrate. Heifers with gilded horns buckle under the death blow, right? The heifer motif, the sacrifice motif coming back here, indicating that some violence is likely to come out of this eventually. His statue comes to life, and he marries her, right? So we have Pygmalion and the statue, right? Like Daphne as a tree is for Apollo, a created art object that can't really say no to Pygmalion's embraces. And they have a daughter called Paphos. And Paphos has a son called Cinerus. And Cinerus has a daughter named Mira. And so what becomes of this family here? What happens between Mira and Cinerus? Yeah, the daughter falls in love with the father, right? Now, there is actually a logical connection here. The grandparents were an unnatural pairing, right? A human being with an object, right? With a statue of ivory. And so, as the generations proceed here, right, the, the unnatural passion that Pygmalion conceived for his statue punishes future generations who develop unnatural passions of their own, right? So Cinerus and Mira, right? Mira tricks Cinerus into impregnating her. Once she's found out, she runs off, turns into a tree, as tends to happen, Seems to be a thing. Yeah. 
and she has a son named Adonis. Now what becomes of Adonis? takes Adonis up as a lover? Okay, yeah. He's taken up by Venus, right? And who was responsible for turning Adonis' great-grandmother into a human being in the first place? Yeah. Venus, yeah. So this is a chain of events that she set in motion, right? She's present at the beginning and at the end. If we look at what happens to Adonis, <coughs> on page 1115, and after warning him, she went off on her journey, carried aloft by her swans, but his courage resisted her admonitions. It happened that as his dogs followed a boar they were tracking, they roused it from where it was hidden, and when it attempted to rush from the forest, Adonis pierced it, but lightly, casting his spear from an angle. With its long snout, it turned and knocked loose the weapon, stained with its own blood, then bore down on our hero, and as he attempted to flee for his life in sheer terror, it sank his, its tusks deep into the young fellow's privates, and stretched him out on the yellow sands where he lay dying. Now, this, the way Adonis dies actually matters, right? This is actually important. Essentially, what does the boar do to him? <laughs> where, where's it hidden? <laughs> so he based, the, the thing basically, oh, I don't want to say it. I'm going to be. Basically. Ex yeah. Yes, that's yeah. exactly yeah. what happens here, right? Yeah. Yes, the boar castrates Adonis. Now, <laughs> why is it significant here, given the nature of this particular family tree, that the boar doesn't just kill Adonis, it castrates him? That's due to like the bloods that um, pig, pigmalion. Had for yeah, this is punishment, ultimately, for Pygmalion's unnatural lust, right? And this is also, you know, this is a way to ensure that this unnatural bloodline that keeps getting weirder and weirder <laughs> doesn't continue, right? Adonis is hitting the privates to ensure that he does not himself reproduce, right? Nature steps in and thwarts even the will of the gods here, right? There's something more powerful at work, right? The boar comes in and does the work, you know, and essentially undoes the work that Venus had done, right? If not for Venus, Adonis would never have been conceived and born. But because of Venus, the natural world steps back in, right, and takes Adonis out, removes him from the equation. So it seems as though Ovid sets up a world in which nature has its own set of defenses, even against the gods. Now, it's also significant here in this story of Atalanta and Hippomenes, just before this, the goddess whom they offend is Cybele, C-Y-B-E-L-E. -E. Now, you probably don't remember this when we talked about myth and its relationship to ritual practice on the first day of class, but you remember I told you about that uh, Roman cult called the Gali, 
which the priests would uh, one day a year drop a whole bunch of magic mushrooms and castrate themselves. This was the goddess they worshipped. So there's a reference to castration in the story just before Adonis's death, right? Almost sort of foreshadowing what is about to happen to him, right? This is how intricately many of these stories are woven together. All right, so <clears throat> what other questions do you guys have about this? What other comments do you have about any of this stuff? <laughs> you willing to buy this so far? So let's talk then a little bit about a couple of these other tales sort of in the middle. So we've looked at the beginning, we've looked at the end, right? There are these stories in the middle. <coughs> um, in particular, this, the seasonal myth about Ceres and Proserpina, right? So what we've seen here thus far Right, as we see Ovid undermining epic conventions, we see, um, what the hell? All right. right, we see that he seems to regard lust as a more powerful force than reason, right? <coughs> that everything is made out of chaos, and that the values of Augustan Rome are by and large a lie. Now, the way the book is set up, and of course I brought the wrong notes, right? There's a classicist by the name of Brooks, uh, Brooks Otis, and Otis divides the, bo the, uh, divides the book up into four parts. Right. The first he calls the Divine Comedy. Right. Essentially, comic stories about the romantic foibles <coughs> of the gods. What the hell is going on out there? I think it might be the cash. Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. The second, oh, what the hell is the second? Um, this is suddenly slipping my mind. <laughs> I should have brought my notes. Um, okay, the fourth is, right, Rome and Foundation of Empire. Right, the second <coughs> is focused mostly on divine punishments, the gods inflicting pain upon mortals. The third, narrated by the poet Orpheus, is about the tragedies of love, right? normal mortal human love. And then the final portion of the book leads up to the foundation of Rome and the deification of Augustus, right? Augustus becomes um, a god and is made a star in the sky, right? Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of schools of thought as to why Ovid would have considered this necessary. Um, I don't know if those of you who did the presentation turned this up in your research, but um, towards the end of his life, Ovid was exiled uh, from Rome for reasons that are largely unknown. There are some people who speculate that it was because he knew something nasty about the imperial family, perhaps a secret about um, Augustus's daughter, who was known for her pointedly not obeying the uh, kinds of uh, moral strictures that her father put forward. Um, it also may have had something to do with something he wrote, right? Ovid was, apart from the metamorphoses, known primarily for um, 
two sets of erotic poems. The first was called the Amores and was a fairly conventional set of love poems, right? If maybe a little bit filthier than we would imagine a love poem would be. The second was called the Ars Amatoria. The Ars Amatoria was essentially a seduction handbook, right? It's meant to be tongue in cheek, right? It's comical, but it, you know, it, you know, give, you know, gives good pickup lines, um, explains, you know, places where to go get a date, um, describes in detail um, certain sexual practices, and it's often been thought that this was considered so offensive to Augustus and to his idea of Roman morality that this was what got Ovid sent away. I would argue, actually, that it may have been the metamorphoses that got, off, that got Ovid sent away, because its central conceit, right, that everything comes down to chaos, that everything comes down to disorder, and that order is a total illusion, I think would actually be more offensive to the Augustan sensibility than a couple of dirty little poems about sex. Right. Essentially, this poem undermines the whole idea of what Augustus is striving for. But, by making Augustus into a god at the end of this, right, we see the poet perhaps trying to ingratiate himself a little bit with the regime and take some of the heat away. But most of what we don't actually have in our excerpt anything from this fourth part, which is too bad because it's actually pretty important. Um, most of what we have is from part one and part three. So let's look for a minute at that Iphis and Yanthe uh, story that, um, or <coughs> that you guys referenced in your presentation, right, in which the goddess Isis steps in to try to um, rectify this particular situation, right? Now, does anybody know why it's a problem for this man Ligdus that he's about to have a daughter rather than a son? I mean, apart from a general, does anybody know why there was a cultural preference from boys for boys apart from mere patriarchy? Yeah, exactly. It's a dowry culture, right? So daughters cost you money. Sons get you money, right? If it was a bride price culture, things <laughs> might work the other way, right? Daughters might be a bit more favored. A daughter makes you money. In a dowry <coughs> culture, a daughter costs you. Right, so the logic that leads people to favor sons is that, well, one, I'm just raising someone for someone else's household that I'm essentially, that I'm essentially going to have to pay for. Right? Remember that marriage in a lot of these earlier cultures is a financial transaction between wealthy families rather than a love match, right? So the whole idea here, yeah, is that daughters cost you money, sons get you money. Now, what does this story suggest about Roman attitudes towards gender otherwise? We have, you know, Iphis is born a girl, raised a boy, transformed into a, transformed into a man upon reaching adulthood through the action of a goddess who actually probably could have done this at any time, right? So what might this suggest about Roman attitudes toward, or about Ovid's attitude towards gender? If it's so easy for Iphis to turn into a boy, 
how natural does he seem to think Roman gender divisions are? I think it says that I, he himself agrees a lot with that men are better than the women. Because he's making well, it seem because like because the god or goddess did transform him into mm -hmm. transform her to a boy, he yeah. makes it look like the gods even favor having men over women. And Isis is um, a goddess of maternity, motherhood. Um, kind of midway. It's actually a foreign goddess as well. She's not a Roman goddess. She's an Egyptian goddess. But I think that what's actually more important here in the story as Ovid relates it is less that boys are favored, girls are not, and more that it's so easy for Iphis, who has been raised as a boy, and doesn't know how to behave as a girl, to be physically transformed into a man, right? Now remember that Roman culture, much like the Greeks, maintained a kind of rigid division between what was masculine behavior, what was feminine behavior, right? Men were allowed particular liberties that women were not permitted. Women had a particular role in the home, men, did most of the sort of public social work. The, the, uh, the Greek concept of the oikos translates pretty cleanly into Rome, but they use a different word for it. This is domus, right? Which literally simply means house, but it's the same concept as the Greek oikos. So <clears throat> I think what Ovid is illustrating here, I think he's making fun of the rigid gender divisions within Roman society and arguing that they are in fact artificial. That they're socially constructed rather than primarily biological, right? Iphis is raised as a boy and only knows how to behave as a boy. Right? Does not know how to behave as a woman. And this is, you know, um, what this is pointing to as well is like a, a debate that people still have in psychology, right? The whole nature versus nurture thing, right? How much of who we are is based in biology and is thus immutable, unchangeable, and how much of who we are is based simply in the way that we're raised, right? So I think that what Ovid is doing here is a kind of early intervention into that nature versus nurture debate and arguing that everything is socially constructed, right? It goes back to that whole thing at the very beginning of the poem, the idea that all we have at the beginning is chaos and something has to throttle all that chaos into order. But that order is artificial. It has to be imposed by something else, by something strong and is always threatening to come loose. And so this is another sort of instance where that, or, that order proves to be artificial, right? You raise someone as one particular gender, they easily biologically change into that gender. So that's, I think, the basic point of this particular myth. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? So we are kind of running short on time here. Anything? Good? Okay, so next time we're going to be looking at Chinese philosophy. We're going to be reading some excerpts from the Analects of Confucius. So let me put up some questions for that.